Hello, I'm the Culture Genie, and today we are going to discuss Carthage. But no, we will not be speaking about Hannibal, nor the Romans in this video. At least not much. Instead, we are going to focus upon the darker side of Carthage. Its empire and its society. And in order to do that, we are going to travel to where it all began. We are in the 9th century BC. Phoenician explorers, merchants and colonists from what is modern day Lebanon are currently busy exploring and colonizing North Africa. These Phoenicians were not united under one common national state. Instead, they were a collective of explorers coming from various city-states in what is modern day Lebanon. This is where Carthage has its origins. Carthage began as a colony of the Phoenician city-state of Tyre. According to legend, the city was established in the year 813 by the legendary Queen Dido. Regardless of the legend, this was not something unique, as it was a city alongside many other cities and settlements that both Tyre and other Phoenician cities had established following the Bronze Age collapse more than 300 years earlier. Thus, Carthage began in a context of newly founded Phoenician city-states alongside some older settlements from earlier Phoenician colonizations. During the 7th century, after the Assyrians had conquered the home city of Tyre, Carthage became independent. In what is going to follow in the several centuries, Carthage is going to invade and subjugate its neighboring Phoenician city-state rivals such as Utica, Hippocra, Aspis and Siago, forcing them to comply with various trade deals and political treatises. This was the same thing as what Rome would do in the coming centuries. What Rome was to do, Carthage had already done in the preceding centuries before the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage. Carthage also turned its attention to the surrounding Libyan Berber tribes that lived more inwards in modern-day Tunisia, subjugating some of them and allying itself with some of them, implementing a sort of caste system with a lower Berber Numidian class and a Punic non carthaginian middle class and the Carthaginians at the top. Remember, the Carthaginians as Phoenicians were foreign colonizers of North Africa. And the Berbers were the natives, though the Phoenicians had been around for a couple of hundred years by this time. We actually know about one of the later campaigns against the Berbers in the subjugation of the Masuli, who had rebelled against the dominance of Carthage in the area. The ancient Greek historian Diodorus notes Hasdrubal, the son-in-law of Hamilcar, having been sent by his father-in-law to Carthage to take part in the war with the Numidians, who had revolted against the Carthaginians, cut down 8,000 men and kept 2,000 alive. The rest of the Numidians were reduced to slavery, having formerly paid tribute. Given how common slavery was at that time, it should come as no surprise that Carthage practiced slavery. Just as a little note here that it was existence in Carthaginian society. Hamilcar, by the way, is the father of Hannibal. This is a revolt directly after the loss of Sicily in the first Punic War. One thing to know is that all of these client states or subjugated city-states and tribes that were under Carthage were forced to provide troops or mercenaries for the Carthaginian army. And uh, with the loss of Sicily and uh, the loss against the Romans, they rebelled. To avoid the threat that successful mercenary armies as the majority of the armies of Carthage were composed of these mercenaries rebelling against them due to not having any sort of great loyalty to Carthage. They implemented a structure of making sure that all senior and middle command positions were held by citizens of Carthage 
This was just a continuation of the general hierarchy that already existed in Carthaginian society. Nevertheless, despite this precaution, in several instances, mercenary armies would prove to be disloyal and even cause infighting between the rival clans of Carthage aristocracy, most famously during the Mercenary War from 241 to 237 BC, which is described by Diodorus, although it's only just a part of a much larger uprising. Since the Carthaginian Empire, or rather colonial domain, as it was not an empire but a kind of semi democratic republic, actually included a lot of foreign peoples that were subjects and had to provide mercenaries for the centralized Carthaginian state. We have to remember that at the same time that they were conquering their neighbors during the first centuries of Carthage existence before the Punic Wars. They were establishing colonies both in Sicily, Sardinia, the Iberic Islands and in the Spanish Peninsula. Especially under the Carthaginian general Malchus, who later became kind of a king but was exposed by Marcos, who founded the Magonoid dynasty, one of the important families of Carthaginian history. About 300 years before the mercenary war and the, the revolts against Carthaginian hegemony after the loss in the First Punic War. So we have established that Carthage had a large colonial domain with many peoples that were subjugated under them. But that raises the question, why do these conquests? And why colonize? Well, the answer to that is actually pretty simple. In order to secure trade and resources to trade. It was all part of a commercial, imperial or hegemonic strategy. They colonized for example Spain due to silver mines there. They colonized several of the islands in the Mediterranean in order to secure trade lines for their maritime dominion. The Phoenicians, or Punics as the Romans like to call them, had always been known as traders. And this goes back even to when they originally came from what is modern day Lebanon and the city of Tyre. With regard to trade, the Carthaginians had a truly enormous trade network. And they traded as far as Persia in the east and the British Isles in the northwest. This mercantile activity created a stereotype of Punic peoples such as the Carthaginians being mercantile, treacherous, prone to backstabbing deals and uh, involved in various conspiracies. In other words, they had stereotypes ascribed to them which were similar to those stereotypes that exist today about Jews. And this is also the reason why Punic was and still is an insult meaning treacherous, mercenary, and or merchant-like. Though we should probably not take these stereotypes at face value as they were primarily spread by their enemies, such as the Greeks, who they competed a lot with in trade, and the Romans, who they fought several large wars with, you know, the Punic Wars, which eventually resulted in the destruction of Carthage. Carthage was a large maritime dominion that focused upon trade and commerce and colonization in overseas colonies against Rome, which was a contiguous land empire. The relationship between Carthage and Rome before and during the Punic Wars was kind of like Britain against Germany during the World Wars, only this time the land empire won. I did not want to focus upon the Romans in this video. But I just wanted to say this because the Punic Wars were not wars between an aggressive Rome that uh, met a peaceful people, but rather two very expansionist states, albeit in two very different ways. It should be remembered though that colonization and expansion was the name of the game back in antiquity. So neither Rome or Carthage really stand out more than in their success. 
as we have now discussed the outer politics of Carthage throughout history, maybe we should discuss the internal society instead. This is where Carthage will really stand out from its contemporaries in the ancient world. What is first needed to be known is that Carthage was a society dominated by religion, even by the standards of its time. And this was a much more religious time than the modern western world. The government of Carthage was a strange sort of theocratic democratic republic during most of its history. Not too dissimilar to modern day Iran in certain aspects. It was a government with a strong religious element, with religious groups and laws controlling part of the government and other parts left to more democratic forms of government. Though our knowledge of the Carthaginian system is somewhat lacking due to lacking sources and those we have do have a tendency of being biased against Carthage. There were certain parts of the society which were totally governed by religion and then there were certain parts which were left to up to popular vote to be decided upon. Though just like in Rome there were only a few families which dominated politics and religion of Carthage. Though it seems to at least maybe have been a bit more social mobility than in Rome, it was still a society with great hierarchies and families. Like the previously mentioned Magonites and the Barkids, you know Hannibal and Hamilcar's family, dominating society. And the voting rights were only afforded to Carthaginian free citizens, so no slaves or foreigners. I know non Carthaginians were allowed to vote. Though women might have had the franchise if they were citizens. I could find no sources for or against it. So it may be the case that we just don't know. However, going back to what I mentioned about the religion being important. The Carthaginians worshipped several gods, but they did not have all equal standing. In fact, there was one god they worshipped more than the others, almost to an henotheistic level, i.e. they only worshipped one god despite accepting the existence of several other gods. Well, what's this god you might ask? His name was Malkort, the chief god of the old mother city of Tyre. Malkort they usually worshipped in the aspect of Baal Hamun, the lord of incense and lord of the other gods, though Baal was primarily a fertility god in his secondary functions. In other words, he was associated with harvests, fishing and acts which I'm not going to describe here due to wanting to keep this channel clean, but in their most basic form they ensure the next generation of people. Baal as a name actually means Lord. And you can actually see his name in several famous Carthaginian names, like Hannibal, which is beloved by the Lord or Baal, or Hasrobal, Asrobal, help of the Lord, Barakbal, blessed by the Lord, Abd Hamon, servant of Hamon. Very similar to how you in the Arabic world use a lot of names related to Allah, like Abd Allah, Nasr Allah. Notice also the similarities in the languages between Phoenician and Arabic since they are both Semitic languages they share a lot. For example the word Abd, servant, in both languages. And Baal means lord, though it's much more used as husband in Arabic as lord of the household. But I am getting sidetracked. The focus here was the fact that a lot of the names in Carthaginian society carried the name Baal just to show how religious they were. However, as regards to the religion itself, maybe the most infamous practice in this Baal-based cult that was the foundation of Carthaginian society was the practice of human sacrifice, particularly the sacrifice of small children. Most of the civilized world, thus excluding the Gauls and the Germanic tribes in this matter, did not practice human sacrifice. This included the Romans, Persians, Egyptians, Greeks and Jews. They all 
they do not practice human sacrifice, and especially not the sacrifice of children. And many of the surrounding civilizations saw this as utterly barbaric. First, the children would be killed in some ritualistic manner, and then burned almost like an incense. Fitting for the god with the title of the Lord of Incense. The 3rd century BC Greek historian Cletarchus identifies Malkart Baal Hamun as being some sort of analogue to their Greek god Kronos and describes the sacrifice as the following. Out of reverence for Kronos, the Phoenicians and especially the Carthaginians, whenever they seek to obtain some great favour, vow one of their children, burning it as a sacrifice to the deity, if they are especially eager to gain success. There stands in the midst a bronze statue of Kronos, its hands extended over a bronze brazier, the flames of which engulf the child. When the flames fall upon the body, the limbs contract and the open mouth seems to almost be laughing until the body slips quietly into the brazier. What I just described is something very dark, but it also shows the fanatical devotion shown by the Carthaginians towards their faith. Think about how far it is to sacrifice your own blood to the divine in order to show your devotion, in order to gain the favor of your deity. How far you have to go when you sacrifice your daughter or your son. Of course, the Baal cult also included more normal sacrifices of animals. But in order to impress the gods or in times of great need, human sacrifice of children was made. And there also exists the fertility rites, whose nature I will not mention due to wanting to keep this video somewhat clean. But let's just say that the Baal cult in certain ways would be what most people would imagine the worst of pagan fertility religions to behave as. However, yet again, it is much more complex than that, since the religion actually functioned as much of the basis for society. It could have not just been a total crazy cult, because otherwise the society would have not have lasted. And the temples were closely tied to the state and functioned as administrative centers. This is speculation on my part, but the sources describe the religion as controlling a great deal of the society and of the politics. So a law based upon religion seems very likely. And this will be very controversial, but I imagine that it was something similar to the Halakha in Judaism, or the Sharia in Islam, or the Kanun found in the Ethiopic fetish Agast. And what do I mean by that? I mean a sort of moral code that says what is forbidden or what is allowed in society. And based upon divine legal precedents. If you work from the assumption that faith can make people take drastic actions such as sacrificing their own family, then the religion can probably also work in order to stabilize and structure society. It should work in both directions with the religion. The religion required sacrifice, but it also gave structure and a way of life to these people, until Carthage was burned down and the religion was forbidden by the Romans. David Soren says the following with regards to Carthage and its religion. There was a peculiar dualism in Carthage, in which the thrust of commerce, prosperity, and the good life were blended with a religion so intense that the richest Carthaginian could cheerfully consign a son or daughter to the flames of the sacrificial pit to redeem a pledge to the gods. Now again it's just speculation on my side. But a religion such as the Carthaginian one would not have survived if it didn't offer at least some types of benefits to society or to the believers. And as the winners write the history, and the history was written by Greeks who they competed with before the Punic Wars, and the Romans who they fought against, together with some Jews who wrote generally about the Phoenicians, and were monotheistic and against the Baal cult, then it was considered that there must be some great bias against the Phoenicians and Carthaginians, and Thus, it was a long-held opinion that human sacrifice did not actually exist in the Carthaginian religion. It was not practiced. That was until we found archaeological evidence that pointed towards this being the case. Urns containing the burnt bodies of 
children were found, which fits the descriptions of burning child sacrifices. So that proved to actually be true. Though again, as I said, the, the sources are still biased since they don't mention anything else about religion and religions usually have moral aspects in them and rules to follow. So it's very probable that there existed actually some sort of positive aspects in this religion as well. Especially if society was controlled by it. So to summarize, Carthage was a state that had expansionist ambitions, took over its neighbors, practiced colonialism and had a religion that both led to child sacrifice and probably to keeping the society together and giving order to it. This, I think, is a good contrast to the more popular historical view of Carthage as being kind of this passive, almost peaceful victim of Rome rather than an agent in history by itself that has remained largely unknown due to the lack of non-biased sources regarding Carthage. I made this kind of video because I want to make the picture a bit more complicated regarding Rome and those civilizations that surround Rome because I think that there has developed kind of a view that imperialism is bad and Rome was the foremost practitioner of imperialism. Thus, Rome must be bad and everyone surrounding Rome must have been good in this kind of dichotomous thinking. As I don't like moralizing history, I try to avoid it even when speaking about Carthage and child sacrifice. This does not mean that I support it or any other of the acts described here in this video. I just want to give a more complicated, fuller picture of the world and human life in it. I hope you enjoyed my video about the darker side of Carthage. And if you have any questions, you can post them in the comment section. I'm always open to discussions. Oh, and if you liked the video, don't forget to push the like button, as it helps the algorithm for me. Please do subscribe as it would help the channel spread awareness about the humanities.